So I got my dream job, my dream job. And the timing was perfect, because it was right before I turned 40. And I was ambitious, I was energetic, I was insufferable, but I had my dream job. and paid a lot of money. And then it didn't work out. Now, it didn't work out, it's kind of like a fancy word for you get fired. <laughs> but with fancy jobs, they never fire you, they just kind of tell you it's not working out and then they give you a boatload of money, which actually is better than being fired, but, but it hit me hard. One minute I'm on top of the world and now I'm just, I'm brooding, I'm home. I start smoking cigarettes. Cigarettes! Yeah. <laughs> right! Now, granted, this is a time like, you know, France, even the dogs are smoking cigarettes and I'm sitting there brooding quietly with just all day long. I'm doing nothing. I'm not going out, I'm not talking, I'm just in this spiral of misery. I cannot just get my head around it. Everything was going so great and, and now it was all gone. Why was it gone? What had happened? And so I just get up in the morning and I brood again and smoke. Now, or sometimes I dance. <laughs> yeah. So the um, paper used to come, the newspaper. So this, you know, we're going back a ways. So the only other thing I can do besides smoke and brood and sulk and, uh, is read the paper. So days turn to weeks, a week goes by, now it's a month. I have my little ritual, I go downstairs, I bring in the paper, I have my coffee, I smoke a cigarette. And I see, I see in the paper there's a little article, and it was a story I'd kind of been following through the fog of my self-loathing and despair and shame about the job not working out. And um, what had happened is about five years earlier, a little boy was killed. And he was killed, and he was dumped, and they didn't know who he was. He was a little boy in a box. And um, they tried to solve it, and they didn't know, and the police had it. And, um, but I'd seen that, but the part of the story I didn't know was there was this woman in North Philly, and her name was Mary. And, and Mary called the police, and she said, what you gonna do with that little boy? And they said, what? She said, well, who's gonna bury? Who's gonna bury that little boy? Who's gonna claim him? It, it bothered her. And, um, and the police said, well, right now, it's, he's, he's evidence, evidence. This is pre-DNA, they have them, they don't know, but they think maybe someday they'll find something that will let them know who did this to this, to this boy. But Mary doesn't give up, so she starts calling every month. This Miss Mary, you know, finally she develops a, cultivates a relationship with the inspectors, they know who it is. You know, how's the investigation going? Oh, no leads yet. Well, eventually, a couple uh, years into it, the science has come, so now they can release the baby for burial. They have what they need to solve the crime. So Mary decides to have a funeral to give this boy what he deserved, what she wanted. Well, everybody here knows needed to happen was to put this poor soul to rest. And the funeral was going to be today. Palm Sunday. It's going to be today. And I'm sitting here, and... I'm smoking and my coffee's there, but, but, but something had changed. I was like, I, I, I think I'm going to go to this funeral. If, if Miss Mary could bury this boy, then I could put down my cigarettes and, and go pay my respect, pay my homage. Now this is, you know, before Google, before anything. There's a little thing in the paper, the name of a church, a, a place. I don't know where it is. I think I called, like, the operator got out my phone book and got into my car. And like into my car, this is the first time I legit had left the house in you know days, weeks, but, but there I am. And, and it was that kind of spring when there's a little snow on the ground, it's kind of still cold, but when you walk it squishes. And the cemetery's way up in a, like northeast, not, not the great northeast, like kind of what you might call the Badlands if you didn't know any better, but everything was donated. And I was a little late, but I pull up and, and there's this vast cemetery with a little snow and I hear bagpipes. That's the first thing I hear. And I look and there's a little knot of people and uh, 
way more reporters than mourners. There's Miss Mary, a couple nuns, and a priest with a red face doing the service. And I just come up and join them. And a um, little box, a little box this big. You just couldn't. And at the end of the service, everything was donated. The priest says, and now, now, a stranger has been moved to compose a song in honor of the dear wee boy. Someone wrote a song. We all look. We look. Everyone turns around. The cameras turn around. The people turn around. I realize with horror, it took a minute, they're looking at me. I've been mistaken for a person that wrote a song about the dear wee boy. But, but I had it. I don't. I don't sing. You don't want to hear it. But, but there they were. And Channel 6 and the nuns and the priest. And, and I just... Something. But sometimes in your life, this moment of grace just descends. And I said, well, why don't, instead, why don't we all just join hands and sing Amazing Grace? And, and that's what we did. And then, and then the next morning, the morning after, I got up and I started looking for work. <laughs>